Good morning, everybody. I'm going to read you a passage. This is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 to 42, it looks like. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So today I just want to say thank you for all of those who have signed up to help in various ways. You are giving that cup of cold water. And it is appreciated, and as Jesus promises here, it is rewarded too. So, thank you, and I will give you a break here for the next several Sundays, and we'll talk again maybe sometime in October. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone who has, um, as Peter has shared, has offered to help with the many, many things that make the church go uh, keep going and functioning. So, thank you so much. Um, speaking of that, next Sunday is Rally Day Sunday. Um, it will be our, I know, very excited. It will be our last um, summer worship service. So it will be the last Sunday with just one service at 9.30. So please note, starting on September 17th, we will return to a two-worship schedule. So 8.30 first service. 1045 second service. So you got to set alerts and reminders like I do so that I don't forget these things. Uh, please do that. Um, speaking of Rally Day, there are still opportunities to help sign up for setup. Uh, Chrissy and a couple of others are organizing that. They will contact everyone. So if you're wondering what the timeline is, um, I'm not 100% sure, which is actually a good thing. That means that I have not been in the midst of it, having to micromanage things. So take my lack of knowledge as a good thing. Um, but Chrissy will, and the team will be contacting folks. So if you're like, ah, I don't know, sign up. If you can't do it, that's okay. Um, if you can't do it at the time that they're doing it, that's okay. But please, um, if you're available next Saturday to help with setup, um, and if you're available next Sunday to help with take down, that will be greatly appreciated. Um, we are still in need of canopies. So if you have a tent or kind of like a canopy that can that's mobile and can kind of pop up, like we've got one from Aldi's that's this like mobile gazebo that like pops up and folds down into this nice carrying bag. Um, so if you have something that is easily movable, we would love to have that. This will still be warm and this will give folks plenty of shade and spaces to kind of sit away from the sun and if there's any um, annoying uh, flying critters. Um, elephant, white elephant donations are still welcome. We will be using those as prizes. I've seen a number of really lovely, fun things. A good way to get rid of stuff that's in good shape, but you're like, hey, it's just not speaking to me anymore. Maybe it'll speak to somebody else and they'll have fun with it. So we would love, love, love to have that. Um, the office is going to be closed tomorrow in honor of an observation of Labor Day, but it'll also be closed on Tuesday. Um, and then I'm going to be gone this week and will have limited access to my email. So Pastor Amy Gillespie from St. James in Lake Forest is the on-call pastor. Her contact information is in the midweek blast from this last week. And if you're like, Pastor, I don't get email, where else can you get the midweek blast? Narthex, thank you. I was like, audience participation, welcome. Um, so please go ahead and grab that so you can have that information on hand. Um, last but not least, uh, today after service, you are invited to come help pick your own tomatoes. There are almost about 100 tomatoes that are ready to go. So we really, really, really do need you to come help pick tomatoes. Because if we don't pick them and they don't go home with someone, then they, they just kind of go bad. So if you are able to do that, even if it's just five minutes, walk out to the garden, grab a couple of things and come back, that's perfect. Dale has bags and some information on the different varieties if you want to do a bit of a deeper dive on what we have up there. Um, so it's kind of a choose your own adventure of how you want to, how you want to do this. But please, they're so good. 
They're so good. Dale's been keeping our fridge well stocked this summer. And with a little bit of fresh basil from your basil plant and some mozzarella, you got an easy, crazy salad. Um, so, with that, dear friends, I invite you to turn your hearts and minds to worship and to please rise as you are able as we continue with our profession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Take a moment of silence before we continue. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in love.
99.98 in the front of your hymnals.
why am I talking about tension in rubber bands? I'm talking about tension because we um, are kind of like my fingers when it comes to what God wants us to be. God wants us most of all to love one another. And Paul says that in our reading today in a lot of different ways. God wants us to love each other. And when we love each other, we have to be close together, like my fingers, right? You can sort of love someone far away, but it's a lot easier to do it when you're close to them, right? When you're close to them, can I give you a hug? You can hug somebody when you're close to them. You can smile when you're close to them. You can talk to each other. But when you're far away, or if you get into a fight, have you ever had a fight with your brother or sister or friend? I have. Yeah. That's sometimes when you get too close, you end up fighting. And then, don't you feel that tension in your heart when you're fighting or not getting along with someone? Yeah. Well, we need to remember that with the help of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, when we're close to each other, we can love each other. And what else we can do is talk to each other. So you can say, instead of getting mad, you can say, why did you throw that at me? Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they didn't need to. Or you can say, why did you say that? And then you can talk about it. And God can help us love each other like that. So let's remember the lesson for faith. Each other and love. Does that make sense? Think that's what God wants us to do? No, you don't think God wants us to love each other? Yeah, He does. You're just being silly. beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good
good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in singing Psalm 26 responsibly. are hungry, 
feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will, be, you will keep burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Israelites, that 
Messiah would be a descendant of David, which Jesus was through Joseph's line, that the Messiah would be a warrior to vanquish Israel's enemies. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, a king. The, the Messiah would be a king anointed, chosen by God. And that they were ultimately a military conqueror. That they were a Messiah because of their military prowess. Now, over the three, the course of the three years in which these folks had followed Jesus, they had come to believe that he was the Messiah and that he would lead them in a military revolution to overthrow their Roman oppressors. That was what the Messiah was supposed to do. Just how wild, how disorienting, how utterly ridiculous it is that Jesus, their expected champion, just accepted that he would be walking right into his own death. Right? Here, we got Jesus telling them, yeah, I am the Messiah, you're right. But this is what it means to be the Messiah. And Peter, like all of us, waffles in his faith a bit. It's a little wobbly. No sooner has he confessed Jesus as the Messiah, does he then go and tell Jesus that he's interpreting the Messiah wrong. His revelation of Jesus as Messiah had been from God. Right? Jesus says, this doesn't come from you, but this comes from God. And now Peter has returned to looking at things from an earthly point of view and is very, very against what Jesus is saying. The word used to describe Peter's action, right, where Peter goes to rebuke Jesus, is the same verb used when Jesus rebukes unclean spirits and commands them to leave the body of the one he was healing. It is a spiritual call out, so to speak, something akin to what you might think of in an exorcism of sorts. And Jesus turns those tables and rebukes Peter by calling him Satan, a spiritual adversary. Can you, just for a moment though, can you imagine thinking that you are so right about the way things are understood, right? Like you are the only, you are the only one who can say this, that the person who just proclaimed, you just proclaimed to be the long-awaited Messiah, that you rebuke them and tell them that they've got it wrong, right? Can you just imagine that? Once again, this is why I love Peter, right? I can't even begin, begin to count how many times I was just so stubbornly dead set in my way and my way of thinking. And I know I am not the only one. I've talked to all of you before, and some of you can definitely identify with this. We're going to start a club of stubborn holders on. One of the commentaries I read this week, though, shared a story about something that the Buddha was believed to have said. And he once compared taking on one of his teachings, one of the Buddhist teachings, as similar to picking up a venomous snake, right? It's really easy to get bitten by the very same thing that we've sought out. No matter how well-meaning any follower is, they can take his words and unwisely draw conclusions that are so far off the mark that they are the exact opposite of what he meant. And I found that to be a helpful framework when we look at what Jesus is navigating, what the disciples are navigating in our passage for today, of something that's a small snapshot of the larger picture of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. His teachings about what it means to be the Messiah and what the cross means, which we're going to get to in just a moment, but what the cross actually is, they really fit well into this framework because just think of how easily it, easy it is to use Jesus' words to heal or to wound. Jesus turns away from Peter following his own commanding rebuke, get behind me, Satan. He rejects the adversary's attempt to tempt Jesus once more. And Jesus tells the disciples that if they want to follow him, they have to deny themselves and pick up their cross and carry it. Now, how often has this phrase been used to hurt 
and maim and destroy. Far more than it has ever been used to heal and help, I will be honest, I don't think I have a positive association with take up your cross. I have mostly heard it used, this is from my own, my own experience, I've heard it used to keep people, mostly women, in abusive, violent, and life-threatening situations. It's been used to justify oppression as just your cross fair. It's been used to glorify suffering. But pastor, you might say, the cross represents death and despair, grief, pain, violence, the shame of the empire. Of course we're meant to bear our suffering. As if our redemption comes through stoic suffering. Because here, right, what does Jesus offer when he says to take up our cross? <clears throat> take up your cross and find life. Take up your cross, follow me, and find life. That to gain life, we must take up our cross. That the cross most importantly leads to life, wholeness, healing, and freedom, right? Just imagine that. That is opposite of how we are taught to view this statement and to, to treat the cross, right? That the cross leads to life. It's the first part, though, that I think might stick with me the most, that whole denying yourself, right? It's a hard one to do. I wonder how many of you may have had similar responses that I, I have had, right? Like, I don't want to deny myself. I, I don't want to give up the things that I like and the people that I love. I don't want to carry the means of my suffering until I die. I don't want to die on a cross. But wow, if that's the good news that Jesus is trying to tell us, then why are we all here? Who wants to follow a God that promises misery and suffering? I think for me, what helped me my, this week to go, to go beyond that was to recognize that that is a bit of a su superficial surface reading if we just stay in that understanding. Because it seems that on the surface that Jesus is going to succumb to Rome's powers, he's going to suffer, and he's going to die. On the surface, it seems that Israel's great hope, the world's great hope, has been snuffed out almost as fast as he started to shine. On the surface, he is defeated. This is where Peter slips, right? This is where he goes from that, that, that emotional, religious high to a crashing, resounding low. And it might be where we find ourselves slipping too. <clears throat> Don't feel bad. Peter slips, and Jesus still names him as the rock on which the church is built. So I think we're doing okay. But yes, Peter slips. His attention is diverted by his interpretation of the Messiah, his beliefs. He is so focused on himself and his understanding that he can't look beyond his own belly button, right? That navel gazing that started with St. Augustine and many theologians after him who often spoke of sin as a form of being curvatus in se, which is like curved inward on ourselves, kind of like a roly poly buff, right? Like we're just curled in, curled in on ourselves. And then the implication is that God's redemption helps us unfurl and open up. God's redemption takes us from looking at ourselves, from looking at our understanding of the world, which is not a bad thing inherently, right? Like we all have our perspective. We all have our point of view. It is a gift to observe the world and to be active in it. But what Jesus shows us is that we don't have the whole answer because we don't have the whole picture yet. And so Jesus takes this symbol of shame, this symbol of death and of empire and of oppression, this symbol, the cross, that we have so wildly, largely portrayed in our house of worship, and he transforms it to a symbol of life, and wholeness and eternity. That through God's redemption of all humanity upon the cross, we too can unfurl and open up 
that we can do- deny ourselves our belly gazing, right? Deny ourselves thinking that I'm the most important person in the world, that my way is the only way, that the way that I see it is the only way that this can be true, that God can only mean one thing because I have the final word on it. And we unfurl and open ourselves and deny ourselves that understanding, that inward focus, and we return our attention to God, to the life that he gave and redeemed and resurrected on that cross and in that tomb. Jesus has a hard word for his disciples. It's a hard movement to go from imagining that redemption is finally there and that it looks like freedom from Rome and freedom from their oppressors, to be told that the military leader is going to let himself die. But Jesus helps to shift Peter and the disciples, and he helps to shift us so that when we look at the cross, we see a symbol of hope and life. And, and I would imagine that that's where many of us are now today. Many of us have crosses tattooed on us, whether you admit it or not. We have it on our mugs and our notebooks. We like our Bibles to have a big cross on the front. We display them prominently in our houses of worship and in our homes and our workplaces where our appropriate. God takes what we think we know and he makes it so much bigger and so much better than anything we can ever imagine. And he invites us to let go of our fear, let go of our shame, and to accept and embrace the life that he has offered. To pick up our cross, to go as one in the body of Christ, to follow God into eternal life. And he promises us that it is good. So no, we do not carry the means of our own death and the means of our own oppression, but we carry the means of life everlasting. So deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus, and live. Amen. I invite you to please turn to hymn number 667 and to please rise as you are able for our hymn of the day.
confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand. seeker to you, place messages of hope and healing in the mouths of your witnesses, and open your children to your truth when we stumble. Merciful God, we see our prayers. God of steadfast love, renew the earth by your, by your spirit that lands and oceans reveal the beauty of your creation. Challenge us to live humbly and peaceably as part of your world. Merciful God, God of patience, lead those who govern to hold fast to what is good. Guide them to show honor to the people in their care. Overcome evil in all nations and grant peace to peoples and places mired in conflict. Merciful God, God of deliverance, remember all who are suffering, lonely, and pain. Lord, we ask especially that you be with Danny and Don Jacobson and Brian Jacobson and Christy for their healing. We pray that you are with Margaret and her family, Rhonda and Jean, Steve and Tim suffering from depression, Betty, Rhea, Anita, and Mel, and for Lynn. Liberate your people being insulted, persecuted, or in the grasp of the ruthless. Give endurance to workers who preserve on this Labor Day and ensure fair wages and safe working environments. Merciful God. God of justice, equip this congregation to boldly follow you in uncertain times and to remain faithful in prayer when facing challenges. Show us best to love and care for one another and our communities. Merciful God. God of glory, we give thanks for the saints who now dwell with you in splendor. Nurture us in faith until the day we join their heavenly song. Merciful God. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share the sign of that peace with one another.
these gifts, our times, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, needs us and what we have gathered, feeding the world with her love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is the right to give our thanks and praise. We remember that the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is set, all is ready, all are welcome. Invite you to be seated. Just a couple of reminders as we learn our new uh, new rhythm. We will be partaking of communion up at the altar rails. Uh, Jeff and Jason are helping to direct the flow of traffic. Um, you are welcome to stand or kneel as you are comfortable. Um, also, please note that the um, the ramp in the middle of the platform is for wheeled devices, so please don't walk up it without one of those. Um, otherwise, as I've been saying, you'll become a, a person sandwich, which we would like to avoid this one. Um, you are welcome to then place your cups after you partake of the wine or juice in the baskets on the end of the first row. Again, all are welcome at God's table. Come eat and be fed.
to those who are communing with us from home, this is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. I invite you to please rise. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we go now from this time of worship, God goes with us and before us. We do not go alone. We take up our cross to follow him into everlasting life. He sends us now with this blessing. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. I invite you to please turn to hymn number 710 as we sing our sending hymn, Let Streams of Living Justice.